The world is a beautiful but challenging place to live. And let's face it, life hits hard sometimes. So if you find your hopes and dreams and mental well-being needs a boost, you're tuned in to the right podcast. Welcome to Inspire Us with your host, Jay Paul Nadeau, a former hostage negotiator turned motivational speaker and acclaimed author of Take Control of Your Life. And now, here's your host, Jay Paul Nadeau. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inspire Us. Did you ever wonder if you could retrain the brain? Retrain it in such a way that you could create new neural pathways to help you to cope with anxiety or to take new actions? Apparently, you can. My next guest is a brain fitness expert and wellness authority who is going to share some of those tips on how to do that with us. And we so desperately need it at this time. And without any further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce you to that brain fitness expert, Jill Hewlett. Hello, Jill, and welcome to Inspire Us. Thank you for having me. Well, I, you know what? It, it's not every day that you get a brain fitness expert and a wellness authority on your podcast. So I am so delighted to have you here because the brain is a really important thing, obviously. And uh, I, I'd love to explore more of it because uh, it's one area I don't know much about and how we can use it to maximize our circumstances and, and even... Uh, during this very difficult time of COVID, how can we exercise our brains to feel good about what's happening? Because we can't feel good about what's happening, right? Wow, Paul, well said. And so such a pleasure to spend this time with you. And I'm happy to discuss, to discuss all this. Um, brain fitness is, is one of my top passions. So let's go for it. You got it. And I'm incredibly interested in finding out how this all came about for you. So why don't you start us off by telling a little bit about how you got to where you, you did? Absolutely. So, um, well, when I was younger and looking at um, possible career paths, my, um, my draw was toward education and teaching. So that was the route I started to follow as I went into university. But while I was there on campus, I was spending all my time learning about health and wellness because I just had a natural interest in movement and personal growth. And so I was taking workshops and reading books. And so that was always my default to the point where people just assumed I was in the phys ed program. Um, I was working at the fitness center there. I was also working at an, a sports uh, store off campus. So, you know, when you really just kind of listen to where, where you, you know, where you start to put your attention when you're given the freedom of choice, you, then you start to get nuggets. And it's really important to listen to those because those are signs, those are indications of where you really want to be or where, where you're meant to be. Um, so after I graduated with my BA, instead of applying to teacher's college, I thought I'm gonna take a year and explore this, this core passion of mine, which is health and wellness. And a big part of that is movement. And lo and behold, Paul, what blew me away is that I learned about a field of work called educational kinesiology. And I'm like, what? At first of all, I, that was like a mouthful. And I'm like, does that mean another four or five years of school? Um, <laughs> but what it, it turned out that it was a program that was being offered um, in the States and it's actually worldwide. And it's about learning how to draw out a person's abilities, a person's skills, a person's potential through movement and awareness. And the core program of that is something called Brain Gym. And so <laughs> after university, I learned about this program and I started to immerse myself in it. And not too long after I actually became licensed in this field of work. And that was many, one of many different modalities I was studying at the time, because um, when I gave myself the freedom to really do what my heart wanted me to do, Paul, I really immersed myself in it. Like I, I worked full-time jobs to pay for everything, to pay for my, <laughs> my car, my food, my rent. Um, but the rest of the time, I was just like a sponge, just putting myself into this different, into this um, whole field of health and wellness and, and um, fitness. And brain this educational kinesiology and brain gym became the cornerstone of my personal growth 
And then it became the cornerstone of my professional career. So many things happened after that. I traveled a lot. I became licensed in other modalities. I hosted and produced a wellness TV show for um, eight years, actually. Um, really amazing. I was really expanding my network with other people as well, colleagues in, this, in these industries. And finally, um, when I was ready to kind of officially plant my, uh, myself in my, my own business, I launched it as a speaking and training business in the field of brain fitness, because I was able to then leverage my learning that I learned from educational kinesiology and brain gym and incorporate all these other modalities and experiences that I'd had um, personally and working with clients. And that's the program that I now bring into schools, workplaces, community groups. A lot of that is done online now. Um, uh, prior to COVID, that was done in person. But thankfully, the work that I do is very transferable online as well. So I'm continuing to work with clients that way. Oh, that's amazing. And you, brain training. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? Just a moment ago, you touched on something. You said that um, there was something almost instinctive in you that was calling you to this wellness. Uh, is that, are you talking about intuition or are you talking about something else? What's that about? That's a really good point and question. Well, I think, you know, I could go back further into my childhood and I really recognize that what we get exposed to as children also helps formulate our likes and dislikes and our choices. And so I do have to say that growing up, um, thankfully, I had uh, parents who were very um, active in our lives, very engaged. My mom put me in all sorts of different programs and clubs. And then my father had started a sporting goods store. My mom worked with him kind of behind the scenes on it, but he did that up front. He ran the storefront and everything. And I actually eventually had a job there too in my teen years. So, mm -hmm. so there was all this exposure around movement and activity and being involved in things. So I think that was part of my foundation and that just came naturally. But also, there's also where there comes your personal needs. And so I was a very introverted child and you may not know that now, but I was very shy to the point where I almost had to uh, redo kindergarten because I wanted to be at home with my mom and younger sisters more than wanting to be at school. And there was a bit of concern that I wasn't thriving in that environment. I was smart enough, but socially, I was not up to speed. I didn't want to be there. So that summer, at the end of kindergarten, I went to a special camp where it turns out that it was to help me with my development. I didn't know that. I thought it was just to have fun because that's what I did. And I basically remember things like singing songs, doing group games, bouncing on a trampoline. I was doing all these fun things. And I guess that's just, you know, it's amazing. Our brain is so resilient and it's so sculptable and it's so impressionable. And, you know, in our younger years, we're growing at kind of a warp speed. So whatever that was, that two week camp or whatever, I grew a lot and probably all that sunshine too probably helped. So I was ready then and went into kindergarten. And before I knew it, my sisters were at school with me too. But once I got used to being there, that was fine. But the idea of speaking in front of a group, mm -hmm. the idea of <laughs> getting in front of my class for anything, like I had absolute trepidation. Like I would shake like a leaf. I try to be sick on the days that I had a, a presentation to give actually. Inevitably, I'd come back the next day and have to do it. And so I learned kind of fairly quickly there that in my school years, I was going to be needing to be doing presentations in front of my group. And, and I knew that I also wanted to be a teacher. too. <laughs> so, you know, when there's kind of like your own weakness or need, you start to in, in intuitively fill in the gap. Sometimes you're forced to, sometimes your teachers or parents require that of you, but also sometimes even you recognize yourself like, Hey, this is something I need to get over. This is something I need to handle. So so between my kind of highly sensitive um, nature and this whole kind of fear of public speaking, by the time I was in high school, I, um, I actually, it's really interesting actually, just through kind of circumstances, um, putting myself in certain situations and just mindset shifting, I ended up becoming like the girl's athletic rep. I was I was actually doing Whoa. the morning announcements over the PA. I was leading like, 
I was the MC for different assemblies. Like, I, I don't know. And, but funny, Paul, I have to say, I, I, I adjusted to it. I did what I had to do. However, when I got onto my real personal growth journey, which I would say ended up, started at the end of my teen years and began into my 20s and, and onward, I really then started to build the neural pathways for those things. Because part of me was overriding my instinct to feel anxious or to be afraid or to shut down. So I would kind of override those things because I felt I had no other choice. And I remember saying to myself, I don't want to keep overriding an uncomfortable feeling. I want to create a new experience where I actually just am comfortable doing this because there was a, there was a link between where I was feeling like uncertain or, or I don't know, anxious about certain things. And then the other side of it, where I wanted to achieve this goal, I wanted to go into teaching. I was going to be um, branching off into the world and exploring and adventuring and doing things that I wanted to have the confidence and the courage to do. So I started to, um, to learn more about myself through the personal growth uh, modalities and through brain gym, a big part of my growth came from that. And it's been a natural desire for me to share this with others because I know it works because all of a sudden I wasn't as sensitive. All of a sudden I didn't feel anxious. All of a sudden when I had to give a presentation in front of a group, I got excited about it. I wasn't nervous about it. So I can say from experience that you can, it takes time, it takes practice. You get to have to really tune into yourself and see where those, those weaker areas are and build those new links. But it's so possible and it's so worth it because then you're capable of so much more and you basically enjoy, you enjoy life more too. Yeah. And that's really interesting. You said you were overriding some of those feelings in the past. What do you mean by overriding? Were you ignoring them? Were you ignoring it and just kind of, uh, I'll get back to that at some other point. Well, you know what? That's a good point. But this is the thing. Sometimes we just have to do stuff for like, for the example of school, I couldn't get out of doing those presentations in front of the class. I had to do them. Right. So, you know, I just grin and bear it hold your breath, get through it. But there's a difference between just getting through it and actually enjoying it and embracing it and like really letting it move through you, you know? Um, and there's a real difference in that. Now, mind you, there's so much more to be said on this because it's kind of situational as well. And it's contextual because I was giving presentations on topics that we had to do. Whereas now in life, when I moved into my own career path and I was talking about health and wellness, well, I just naturally light up around that, right? So mm. that that is an easier thing for me. It's more authentic. It feels more in tuned with who I am and the types of things I want to be discussing. But there still was a journey from me moving to from one side to the other in my growth. And I just knew it at, at a young age, you know, for some reason I just did. I think I think the school example was helpful because I saw that I had many years of school ahead of me and <laughs> I couldn't get out of going to school and I couldn't get out of doing these presentations. I saw like, I don't know back, I don't know if you, when you went to school, it was like this, but when I did, you had to do speeches every year. You know what? I, that, I wasn't a fan of that. You know, I didn't, I didn't like doing those. And it's interesting because now I am a public speaker. Yeah. So, but I'm speaking again on topics that really mean something to me, that really motivate me. And, uh, you know, that's why I'm doing this podcast with you. So we can talk about <laughs> these types of things that I think, uh, yeah, they, they really, they make my heart sing. And I think other people are more and more interested in this type of content as well. I think they are because right now there's a lot of people who are facing uncertainty they're having to reinvent themselves because perhaps they've lost their jobs. There is that anxiety. There is that depression. There is, there's going to have to be change that's going to be made. How does somebody switch from fearing something to actually moving towards that thing that they fear? Mm. 
That's such a good point. That's such a good point. Well, and you're right, because it's a life skill really to meet challenges and move beyond them because there's our own inner challenges that we have to overcome areas that we know we need to improve in or change or habits we need to release. And then there's the ones that are thrust upon us that, that for example, COVID has presented us with, right? Um, the environment presented us, even like the weather can impact us. There's all the external impacts, right? So I like to talk to people about, um, you know, what can we control? First of all, I think it's about what can we control and what can't we control? And it comes down to, I think first and foremost, recognizing stress, recognizing that something is triggering us and that we're going into a, um, a more limited place of functioning. Um, because if we're not recognizing that, we get so accustomed to our own behavior and our own way of thinking, we almost think it's the norm. Um, but it's actually very unique. No one else thinks like we do, right? We have, we're, we're one in 7.5 billion out there. And, you know, so we're, we're very unique in how we experience the world, how we interpret it, how we respond to it. And so I think a big part of this journey is, is recognizing that and then recognizing when we're in stress, when, and starting to decipher and the word, the opposite word to stress in the educational kinesiology world is balance. So um, it's really neat because when we're in stress, we're out of balance, basically. Now balance isn't something we're always in, right? That's gonna fluctuate, that's gonna ebb and flow. But the, I, the problem is, is when we get stuck in stress and we can't get back out of it, that becomes chronic stress. And that has a really negative impact on us physically, mentally, emotionally, functionally. So um, we need to recognize that. And when we do, then we can use tools to shift ourselves back into balance. So usually before we, um, we go into a situation that's gonna cause us stress or before we even do a habit that we know isn't good for us, we're gonna start to get some sort of awareness. We may ignore it because we've, it's become so familiar, um, but it is something that if we start to set the intention to play, pay closer attention, right. then we can start to notice these things. For example, you might get a tightness in your shoulders or your temperature may start to rise. Uh, you might start to feel tightness in your belly. Your hands may start to clench. Your jaw, you might start to clench your jaw. Um, you might start to notice a headache coming on. All these different things are indicators that you're moving into a stress place. And there's a difference between stress and moving out of our comfort zone, right? right. Because moving out of the comfort zone is an opportunity for growth. And when we're ever, ever we're in a new situation, there's going to be a certain level of stress that comes up. It's the unknown. It's not familiar. We don't have pathways that are already laid down that are effortless and easy for us to move into. So all of a sudden, the, the brain has to work harder. It's searching for some sort of connection or pattern or familiarity. So... So it's normal, that's gonna take more energy and it's gonna cause some disruption. Okay, so those types of things, but there's a difference between saying kind of that I'm on the edge of a new opportunity of growth. There's excitement, but there's some anxiousness at the same time compared to, oh wow, this really does not feel right. This, I'm, I'm, at the, I'm not you know, doing something that's healthy for me. I am impacting myself in an unhealthy way here. This is not the direction I'm supposed to be going on. This is potentially dangerous. Like those are warning signs. Those are alert signs. And I think in the, on the path to making life changes and just basically living our life, it's very helpful to start to learn the difference between the two. And it can be tricky at first, Paul, because we can kind of think if we're not happy and comfortable, then anything else is just stressful and, and not good for us, right? right? And we're, we're, we're mammals, right? Like we have this limbic system, this midbrain that shoots out these neurochemicals that will to try to keep us away from danger and move us towards um, safety and and preserving our um, our genes, right? And 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 keeping us here on the planet, and so and and making us happy, actually. So there, when we start to move into a, an unknown situation like we are right now, so many of us in the unknown of what is happening week to week, we automatically trigger that response that's alerting us to there could be danger. 
when maybe there isn't danger, maybe it's just a whole lot of opportunity, right? But you can't then access higher order thinking and creativity and problem solving and, and self-management and movement towards your goals when you're stuck in your brainstem in like flight, fight, or freeze. Right. So, so, right? So you have to recognize, first thing first, notice I'm holding my breath. I'm feeling tension in my body. A headache's coming on. I'm squinting my eyes, my jaws tight, whatever it is. And then do a couple things that I really recommend listeners try this, do some deep breathing and drinking water. And I know people say it all the time, but they, this is said a lot for a reason. Breathe, get the oxygen back in your system. Because when you're in stress, you're holding your breath and your brain needs to be oxygenated. Your brain does not hold oxygen like other tissues and muscles in, in your body. It, it needs a constant fresh supply. So that will already re-energize you and get you, like, get, ba back, get you back in the present moment. And then drink some water because your brain is an electrical unit and it can't, can make, can't communicate, can't do its functions properly without proper hydration. So breathe and drink some water. And as you start to shift out of that stress reaction and back into balance, you'll be better able to um, you know, think more clearly, focus on the situation, make some executive decisions. And I say executive decisions because then you're moving back into, I have this expandable sphere that I like to show, and it represents moving from a tight wound up stress place to this whole brain connectivity. And in this whole brain connectivity is where you can access your frontal lobes, where your executive functions are. Like I said, problem solving, creativity, time management, organization, self-management, all these things. And when you can access those things, that's when you're in a place to be making good decisions and taking your next step. Um, so I hope I'm answering what your question, but I think, I think that's the route we need to do. And more so than ever, because we're in a kind of, we're in such a, an unknown time, it's triggering stress more often than we've probably ever been used to. And we could talk about all those reasons, like even just parents trying to juggle having their kids home at school and mm. do their work, their lift and shift to their home office, which isn't their regular workspace, which may or may not be conducive to actually getting work done. They're looking after their kids, helping them online school. Maybe they're out of work. Maybe they've got, you've got a person has financial concerns. Um, maybe they've got some health concerns, but they're not able to go and see the specialist or the doctor because a lot of those services are not available right now. Like, who knows what it is, but it's, there's a lot of it going on. And even just the day to day being confined, the lack of socialization, being in front of our screens too much that causes stress, sitting, sitting too much that causes stress. So there's a plethora of examples that we could list. Right. And I think you're, you're getting the gist of it. So we have to, we have to get in the driver's seat and go, okay, I, I'm out of whack here. I'm out of balance. I'm in stress let me incorporate tools to get out of stress first, and then we can take next steps, D breathe deeply, drink water. And then before we finish our, our time together, Paul, at some point, I'll share some other brain activation strategies that can help too. Well, I, I hope you do, because I think our listeners and, and certainly I need uh, some tools because it's not always easy. We put on a good front, but sometimes, uh, you know, we, we get into that, oh, what's next? And oh my God, I have to go forward on this. And let's talk about that because some people are in chronic stress. Some people can't get themselves off the couch because they've lost their jobs. They have this social disconnection and the motivation for even grabbing some water or doing some deep breathing is difficult for some people. What, what could you tell them in their plight? Yeah, great question. And by the way, just as you were saying that, it, it linked to me a realization. That's, I, I love personal growth because it's it's always interesting. It's like la there, it's endless layers that you can uncover. And it's, it's, a, it's a life journey, right? It really is. It's so amazing. And I just made this connection that while well, I was talk, sharing about the importance of recognizing where you're at and if it, what, what this stress is, is it because you're in this exciting opportunity or it's because you're really in an unhealthy situation and we need to alleviate some of the pressure and demands, um, like what's going on? So drink the water and breathe to get into a clearer place to understand that. That is, Paul, the distinguishing factor on 
like if I have to say there's other things too, but I would say at the crux of it, of what the difference was between me in school and then me in adulthood, feeling like not as overwhelmed as such as a, as a highly sensitive person or able to present in front of people and have that natural more courage and confidence. The difference is that when I was in school, no one stopped to help me get the tools to get out of stress first. So I just tried to push the stress away more. Okay, I tried to pretend it wasn't there. Then when I got onto my personal growth path, I started to recognize, which is so important, and this is what's going to lead to what you're asking me. The first step is about acceptance, noticing where you are now. Mm. Okay, so you can't go from one point to another. You can't go move ahead to your next goal without being where you currently are. You have to land and be here now so you can effectively take that next step or leap or change direction, whatever it is. And so as I got onto this personal growth path, I started to learn these different tools to help me get back into coherence, back into balance, back into that present moment. And then I had more resources available to then confront the situation, jump into it, whatever, like give my best, whatever that was at that time. So I think that's the key thing. So, so for somebody who's lacking the motivation, I mean, there, I think what we need to start doing, and once again, you might even talk to a natural path about this too, because there's so many great um, supplements that may help to create more, more hormonal balance in a person's system, because that can be out of whack and that can really cause some, some oppressive type symptoms mm -hmm. um, where I think a person just feels like they just don't have the motivation or the will and it, it is really presenting as a depressed kind of state. Um, so there's things that you can actually, natural things that you can take for that. Um, but as far as looking at it from a brain fitness standpoint, I would say that we need to activate the neurochemicals and you know, the dopamine, the serotonin, the oxytocin, the endorphins, and this is the thing. This is actually, there's a trick to this. Little things will activate it. Sometimes people think when I win that big award or I have that job I want, or I lose those 15, 20 pounds, that's when I'm going to be happy. Mm. That's not how our happy brain chemicals work, actually. Happy brain chemicals, they, they get um, excreted. They're active for a period of time, and then they metabolize and go away because our happy brain chemicals were designed to keep us moving forward in life, doing things that would actually keep us safe and alive on the planet, okay? So right. we think happiness is just a birthright and some people are happy because they've got the perfect conditions and others aren't. Th that's not it, that's not it at all. It's actually that um, even big, that's why enough can never be enough for some people. They get that award, they're happy for a period of time, and then they're flatlining again, or they've plateaued. Then they've got to work on that next goal. So high achievers are not happy all the time either. Now there's people who have learned to, maybe it's partly their demeanor, maybe it's partly their personality type, but I would say in many cases, it's just also a practice that they've learned to be more satisfied with what is, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's a brain training as well. Right? right. So, you know, if we can just start to do little things, whether that's like every whatever is doable every day, like say, okay, I'm having a hard time here, but I am going to, I'm going to make a commitment to drinking more water or while I'm sitting on the couch, becoming aware of my body, doing a scan from head to toe, doing some breathing, doing like a gentle stretch. If you can get up, get up and go for a walk, even if it's only 10 minutes, get outside, get fresh air, get some of the solar power here in Southern Ontario, it's winter and it's been pretty dreary. So it's been harder to get that. So I recommend supplementing. I'm a big proponent of supplementing with vitamin D, vitamin C, um, minerals, um, all sorts of like, there's a program that I take and highly recommend it. I call it the brain body fuel. So um, that's key. But if we can do some little thing to get that spark going, to get that, get those neurochemicals starting to act for us, then I think what you can, then what you can build on that. And you know what, this is a crazy thing too. How the brain works is you can actually start to enjoy an activity you don't like. Like there's some things people think like, I don't like doing the laundry or the dishes. 
yeah. you can train your brain to like doing it. And so it's, it's really, you know, it comes down to being a choice. And I guess I'll leave one other thought too, is maybe if someone is really, maybe it's just not their time to make a change. We all go through different seasons and sometimes that there isn't enough motivation or readiness. And maybe it's just not that right time for someone to make a change. But I think if anyone even has an inkling of desire to make a change, they can. Because even every thought we have, every thought we have is a neurochemical event. Like mm. think of your, your, each thought is an event that's happening in your system. And even just, even if someone doesn't want to get off the couch, start imagining yourself getting off the couch, <laughs> start visualizing it because you're going to lay down pathways that are visualization actually activates the pathways that we would be using if we were actually doing an activity. So that's a, an amazing precursor to get the ball rolling. And with enough repetition, you're starting to lay down some wiring that will make it easier to, for you to actually get up and do. Oh, I like that. Uh, because yes, you're right. I've, I've done that myself. I've kind of visualized what it would be like for me or, or in this moment, how should I be behaving? And, and I, I see um, I, as though I'm looking down at a, at a theater stage and I see myself doing it and it's that much easier. And it gives me a moment to think about what my next step will be. And I think a lot of what yes. you're talking about is, is really your self-talk. You don't like doing the dishes. For me, at one point, it was, I didn't like going to the gym. You know, oh, I have to go to the gym. And I, I switched that over a period of time. I get to go to the gym. I get to work out. And it's just that, yeah, I guess those, uh, th those pathways have been created in me. But yes, a lot of things that I once was hesitant to do, I now embrace because I've talked myself into a different way of looking at it. It's powerful. It is amazing. It is really powerful. And we will, if people, it's helpful to know for people that we're more naturally inclined to talk ourselves out of things. Right. If it requires energy, because our brain <laughs> is an energy hog, so it doesn't want to, your brain never wants to feel low in energy because it, it's survival is at stake. And so, um, you know, and our, like I said, our brain is an energy hog. It needs proper sleep. You need proper hydration, oxygenation proper food, micro and macronutrients, meaning the regular food you eat that would be on your plate, plus the, uh, like, I really, once again, big on supplementing so that you have the right balance of macro and micronutrients. All of this is biochemistry. And when you give yourself this, your brain can do its job that it's meant to do. And it, you can, you can actually optimize your functioning and, and, you know, really improve your results. It's amazing. But if we're just going on the bare minimum, if you're not getting much sleep, if you're not eating healthy, if you're not drinking water and you're just over caffeinated and you're, you know, not supplementing and you're just, your system really is just hanging on. Like it's, it really is. And you start to give it these things that it needs, you'll start to see a changes and the changes are quite significant. The more you continue to do this, right? And then these, these become new healthy habits that your system enjoys and wants to do. Um, but again, your brain is an energy hog. So if it doesn't have all those things, then to ask it to do more, to ask yourself to build new neural pathways, to have the courage to take risks, start a new business, change how you're showing up in your relationships, change your self image. It's like, it's, that's a big ask. Those are mm. really, really big asks if you're not giving your system its basic requirements. So start from the bottom up, I guess, is another thing. And then, yeah, and then once you do have those basic healthy habits in place, for you know, 80-20, it's not like you never have a beer or a glass of wine or a piece of chocolate cake or whatever, that's fine. In moderation, it's fine. Even a one cup of coffee a day is fine. It's just not three, four, five, and think that's your fuel to get you through your day, because it's not, it's having a, at that point, it's having a really negative impact actually. Mm. Um, and then once you have those in place, you can start to then, like you said, shift your internal responses. You can activate those happy brain chemicals on demand. You can shift your mindset. And then with repetition, 
those pathways become stronger. They become myelinated. Myelination is the lubrication that gets laid on the, the axons between the neurons. And so it, it, it allows them to move the messages to become stronger and move faster. And they become like the, the routes of choice because they are, they're like insulated and they're your, they become your favorite pathways. And so you can, you, we, we can't unmyelinate old pathways and old habits. That's why for a period of time, they're very tempting to go back to because they're there and they're handy. You go there without even thinking, but if you, with enough, like just keep staying the course, making positive little changes, new myelination will come into place and you will start to be motivated because motivation was a word you used by, cause you're going to see results. The right. moment you start seeing results, especially if other people can comment on them, but it's hard because we can't see a lot of other people right yeah. now. <laughs> but when you start to see results and you, they start to show up in tangible ways in your life, you become even more motivated. It's like it's like the snowball effect, right? In, 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 in a positive way. No, oh, that's so true. And I go back to my exercising days where I had a little bit of extra weight and I started exercising and seeing the difference, you know, shedding the pounds and, and building more muscle. It just made me that much more content and happy and looking forward to my next workout. So I yes. totally get what you're saying right there. Great example. Can, yeah. Well, for me, it, it really worked and it still does. I, I This has become a, a life thing for me. I, I do it all the time. So let's talk about some of the exercises that we might be able to use to train our brain into facing the unknown and, and uh, getting over our anxiety and our stress and our depression. Great. Let's do that. All right. So let's look at our brain from three different components the physical, emotional, and mental. The brainstem, midbrain, and frontal lobes. And let's think of activities that will start to care for and activate and grow those, those, each of those areas. So I have these, I have tons of brain fitness activities that I share in all my presentations and my training. And I also have a set of brain fitness cards and they're on my website, jillhewlett.com. Mm -hmm. And they're a very affordable, easy download for people. And so I'm just going to recommend right there if people like this, because those cards are, um, they're actually broken into those three categories of the brain. And so in the deck that you get, it's 56 cards. You have the um, intro card, some fun neuroscience, how the cards work, how you can use them in your life day to day or for certain goals. And then the sections are into those three parts of the brain. There's a description of that part of the brain. And then each activity has a, um, an image, uh, an actual stick person doing the activity, um, reasons you might use that um, particular activity on the one side. And then on the back of the card, there's um, a neural nugget. So a piece of interesting neuroscience, neuroscience that goes with that activity. There's a thing to notice before and after, which helps from what we said at the very beginning, Paul, start to become aware of yourself, mm. to notice when you're holding your breath, when you're reacting, when those negative thoughts are starting to consume you. And then there's um, a bullet point description of the activity in written form as well. So there's the, you know, you can see the image and then you can actually read step by step how to do it. So, um, so let's talk about those three areas for a second here. The brainstem, we think of it as the physical or sensory part of the brain. So let's use an outdoor image because we, once again, we can visualize and this will help us. So if one of my favorite places to be is at the beach. And I, maybe other people feel the same. If you don't like the beach and you prefer a forest, you can use that example too, uh, or a park, your favorite park, or maybe it's your backyard. But just the first step would be to get in touch with the brainstem. And it looks to our environment. And, the, and it, it really is where we start to tune into our senses. So if I'm using the beach example, I would imagine being walking on the sand in my bare feet. And so getting in touch with how that would feel on my feet, the warmth, um, maybe even imagining the sun shining down on me too. Maybe there's a gentle breeze, maybe there's a, a balmy tropical feel going on, whatever it is. So you can use your visualize, you can actually, if you are in a situation where you can go to the beach today, go and do it out there. Um, but otherwise we'll just imagine it. And so maybe you're even hearing the waves moving or the types of sounds, 
Now, if you don't want to actually use a visualization, you can just be at your desk, put your feet on the floor, start to feel how that feels. You know, your feet are on the ground. How does that feel? What's it feel like to sit in your chair or stand? Notice the environment around you, notice the lighting, notice the temperature, notice any sounds that are happening. So I'm just giving the visualization just because it can enhance things and it might be mm -hmm. fun to do. Mm -hmm. So once you do that, what you're already starting to do is you're starting to get into that ground up level of base, that ground up um, setup for your brain. Now, when you're in this situation, it'd be great to do an activity that would really help with this physical dimension. And so an example of one is the runner's stretch, the calf pump, where you, you know, stand with your legs, your feet shoulder width apart, and then take one leg back, put your hands on your front leg and stretch out that back leg. And so you feel a nice stretch through your calf, your hamstrings, all the way up through your, um, up to your glutes. So you feel a nice stretch through the back of your legs, right from your heel, all the way up to your tailbone, pretty much. Mm. And so you're doing this nice stretch one leg and then you stretch out the other one. So that's an example. Another one, if you're seated, a variation of that, if you're seated, um, is you just put your legs out in front of you and like straight out. So they're off the ground, lift them up, put them up and lift your toes towards you. And the idea is to bring your nose towards your toes, towards your nose. Okay. And so you do that, if you're, I, I'm doing it right now. If you are, Paul, you may feel that there's a stretch happening along the back of your legs again, right? Mm -hmm. This is all part of this physical dimension. And in brain gym, they call it the focusing dimension because we can't really focus unless we're present in here now. But if our brain stem is off and we're in like flight, fight, or freeze or in stress, and we're kind of holding our breath and we're, we're, we're actually lifting out of our body. We're getting ready to like, fight something or run away from it. We're not feeling steady and secure and here now. That's the state we wanna get into first. Then, okay, so after you do that, so you've done the calf pump or these leg stretches out in front of your toes up, you can actually pump the toes up and down. So you kind of activate it a bit more and then hold them up again and keep doing it while you're deep breathing, drink some water. So that's the first um, element. The second one that we would think about then is the emotional cognitive brain. And so a great thing to tune into here is how you're feeling. So if there's a word to describe, am I feeling tired? Am I feeling down? Am I feeling curious? Am I feeling optimistic? Am I feeling excited? Like whatever the word is, there's no right or wrong. Just kind of notice it, okay? So now you're tuning into that emotional cognitive brain. And a visualization, that you could use is if you are out in this favorite space of yours in nature, how does it make you feel? And if you can find water, whether it's a waterfall, a stream or a lake or an ocean, that's a good thing to think of because emotions are typically connected to a watery image, right? There's kind of an up and down with the water. Um, emotions are like emotion, energy in motion. So water is not a stagnant thing, it's always moving. All emotions have a beginning, a middle, and an end, even though we're, if we're in an uncomfortable feeling, one of the best ways to move through it is to breathe into it and wait it out because it will have a beginning and middle end. The charge mm -hmm. will wear off. But so often we start to get an uncomfortable feeling and we get afraid. We try to push it away. We resist it. And then the cortisol comes on because we're now worried that you know we've got this negative, bad feeling and it's telling us something. But if we actually can just be present to that feeling, there's a good chance it will actually just float right by us, or at least it won't be as strong. It will dial down. So just imagine this, just, no, tune into where you're feeling. Imagine this kind of watery image around you. And then, and you might say, actually, I feel, I'm, I, you might feel so disconnected with your feelings. You might not have any image you can connect to at all or emotion. That's okay. You're just checking in to see what's there and if you can. The other side of the coin might be a person feeling like I'm in a torrential downpour. I'm in a thunderstorm right now. Like my emotions are all over the place, right? There isn't a right or wrong. You're just get, gathering information. And then what you can do to help balance those emotions, um, we can work with the energy circuitry in our body. And one of my favorite ones is to do an all over body massage. And that's just in a small area that has over 400 pressure points. 
And so you're basically massaging your ears. You're, you're taking your hands to either side of your head, thumbs to the front, fingertips to the back, and you're just gently unrolling your ears bit by bit, because as you do that, you're touching upon each of these pressure points. You start at the top and go around right down to the lobe, right around it, and then you start at the top again and do this two, three, four, five times, whatever feels right to you. Feels amazing. Um, as you do it, your ears might get a little warmer, or turn a little red, and that's part of the you know circulation, the activation that's happening. Yeah. And after you do the roll around your ear from top to bottom, bit by bit by bit, you can actually pull your ear out a little bit. This actually helps turning on turn on whole brain listening, meaning listening with both sides of the brain. But also each of those pressure points is connected with a, um, a system or organ throughout your body. So you're getting this, you're really activating this energy flow because when we're stuck, our energy flow becomes inhibited. We wanna free that up again. So that's one way you can do it. Another great way to do this, to emotionally connect is put on a song you like and free dance. Yeah. Don't dance. <laughs> <laughs> when dance like no one's watching do it actually when no one's watching so you can be as silly as you want and just first you might not move as as freely as if you've never done this before you might be more inhibited but eventually you might find that you're moving in ways you didn't expect yourself to mm. and give yourself to do small movements big movements fast movements slow movements try different music maybe even just put a song on for 30 seconds don't expect yourself to dance for the whole three four minutes it's really what feels right for you and what you have time for. But this will get you emotionally engaged and ready to um, participate emotionally. And it will shift any negative emotions and make you more emotionally receptive and available, right? So that's, you know, that's a way to get that inner emotional glow on. And then the last step is the frontal lobes, which is your executive functioning. And so this is kind of, if you're going back to the beach scenario here, um, although once again, you can do this right at your desk, um, you can then at this, at this time, use the power of visualization. Use the power of, um, of foresight. Kind of set an intention if you want. So how do you want to show up at this time? What do you want to create? Doesn't have to be groundbreaking or huge. It can be a little thing just something to give yourself direction to move towards. Okay, so you're giving yourself some structure and you're giving yourself, um, yeah, you're giving yourself an intention to move towards because our system's always looking for that actually. So you get to set it. And so maybe at the beach when it's open and you're on vacation, it's easy to imagine. This is a great time to use your imagination too. Like, blue sky things you know at the same time though maybe if you are just sitting at your desk maybe it's about getting an activity done or going to make dinner <laughs> it could be a really mundane activity like clean up the front room or get the laundry done or whatever it is so that's okay it's all good because guess what the point is to use this activity regularly for small and bigger things so it's up to you and so an activity that we could do together, Paul, to activate this, to get the left and right brain moving together is the infinity sign and tracing it with our eyes and head. Mm -hmm. So you take a finger out in front of you. And yep. the, so the infinity sign is with two loops, right? Yep. And you're just going to, in front of you, trace up and over to one side of the circle and then up and over to the other side of the circle. And breathe as you do this. And the idea here is you're getting your left and right brain hemispheres working together as a team. Hmm. And it's a really great way to give your neck actually a little kind of internal massage, loosen up your shoulders. Many of us are sitting at our desks too much and we're getting brain strain because we're just too sedentary and on our devices too much. And up, after you trace one, one hand with the figure, eight, then change over and trace with your other hand. And when I say hand, I'm putting my finger out. I'm actually just tracing my pointer finger because people can't see us. So I have to make sure right. I describe this well. Right. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, and then there you go. And 
that, okay, so that's one activity and that's amazing. And as you can see, it doesn't take much time, lots of bang for your buck. You're getting your eyes stimulated. You're taking a break from your device. You're getting hemispheric balancing of left and right brain. Another thing you could do, I'm just gonna throw this out there as another one. To bring this all together, one of my favorite things is to take a walk right at my desk. I love to go out for walks, but I'm finding with the weather and my schedule and various factors, I'm not getting the amount of walking in outside that I would like to do. So instead, I just do a walk at my desk where I literally seated here and I take opposite hand to opposite knee, turning my torso, turning my upper body as I take my hand across and I'm actually lifting my leg too a little bit. So you get some nice core stimulation. Mm -hmm. And if you really, if you feel like taking it to the next level, then stand up and walk on the spot, but really exaggerate that walking. Right. Best way to exaggerate it, slow it down because that's going to require balance. Mm. And remember, I'm going to wrap up with this. Yeah. Stress and balance don't coexist. You're in one or the other. So by doing that last activity, you're bringing yourself into balance. You're removing any remaining stress. You're getting back into that present moment. You're getting your body mind connection, body brain connection leveraged. Turning on those frontal lobes because you've already got the brainstem and midbrain now on your side. Now you've got the frontal lobe and now you're in whole brain connection and you're ready and able to, you know, take those next inspired steps whether it's just to get up from your desk to do your next activity, start writing um, a book <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, plan for a move, whatever it is, big or small, you are now going to be more ready to it, ready to do it. And this is an, a process that you can repeat daily. Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with us. And I know it's going to help a lot of people out there who are tuning in and listening. And yeah, you can train the brain. And if you continue to do it, it gets easier, right? It's like a muscle. It, uh, As you said, those pathways get, get deeper and deeper and it gets easier and easier. So Jill, thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything that you have. Are there any parting thoughts that you would like to leave us with? Well, thank you, Paul. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I'd love to do it again sometime. Yeah, um, it's, it's fun chatting with you. I would just say in part that um, imparting that, you know, you have 86 billion neurons. And they are like mini computers. I mean, your, your brain is the best, most clever and sophisticated technology on the planet. It's yours. Mm. You get to sculpt it. It's not only just your you know, opportunity to do it, it's your responsibility. Mm. And little things can go a long way. And so what we discussed in this podcast today is a great starting point. And if people want to learn more ways to sculpt their brain, I, I like to say you, you sculpt your fit brain and fit life, because when you work on your, your brain, it ripples out into all areas of your life. So if people want to carry on that conversation, I would be happy to chat with them. But in the meantime, start with what we discussed today. And um, I'm sure you'll start to see some results and you'll really be in the driver's seat of sculpting your fit brain and fit life. That's amazing. And, and yes, for anyone listening in right now, everyone listening in right now, check Jill's website out. It's uh, jillhewlett.com. And uh, those uh, those cards that uh, that you were talking about, I'm probably going to order. No, I am going to order them today. So uh, yeah, no, there's uh, there's so much about this, and I'd love to have you on the show again to talk about some of the other little interesting things you and I were talking about: bicycles and kids and devices and such. So maybe we can <laughs> we we can plan another another uh, podcast if you're up to it. That sounds great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Jill. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another insightful episode. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and leave your comments. For more information, check out our website at www.inspireus.ca. Remember, it's not what happens to us that matters most. It's how we respond to what happens to us that does. Stay strong and resilient.